actually I got a VC. So that okay. So uh, this class, last class, uh, uh, we have been going through the uh, curriculum planning and uh, then uh, Tabas model, Ron Grace model, and uh, then in Taylor's model. So there are four basic uh, uh, elements in a curriculum. Can you name them? Can you name that uh, those four uh, basic uh, elements in the curriculum? In the last class, uh, we had that. I have already sent you the notes also. Uh, there is uh, one Savindi Chandula. This is the first time I think uh, we meet. Am I correct? Savindi? Yes, sir. Yeah, where are you from? Can you tell me something about you? I am from Rambukkana. Hmm. Uh, my school is Ganetan Mahavidyalaya. <laughs> you are a I teacher teach of mathematics. What's your subject? Mathematics, sir. Mathematics. And uh, are you a graduate or a college of education diploma holder? College of education. Which college? CNN National College. Ah, CNN National College. Okay, you are a maths teacher? Yes, sir. Yeah, right. Okay. So, so this is the first time. No, you have missed uh, two or three classes, I think. Two classes. Yes, sir. Uh, it's okay. But I'll send you, you can get it for these um, notes uh, from uh, this Tarangami. So there is another one. Uh, if not, you can uh, give uh, your WhatsApp number. And so we, I will send you the notes. Okay, I've already told them. Uh, right, okay. Anyhow, we'll start. So can you tell me, Tarangami, uh, what are the four... Basic elements, simply you say, a, when designing a curriculum. Aims and objects. Yeah, yeah. Then the content, content uh, organization, organization and, and evaluation. Right, okay. So those are the four basic things. Okay. So now, so today, uh, we will move on to the next uh, session and I'll share my screen to you. I think you'll be able to see that. Uh, now, can you see my screen now? Can you see the screen? Oh, oh yeah, now, yes, sir. Yes, okay. So, so the today's topic, principles of uh, curriculum development. So, what are the basic principles that you are going to consider when developing a, a curriculum? Mm -hmm. So, uh, Actually, the purpose of a curriculum should identify and select knowledge, attitudes, and skills which should uh, necessarily be provided for the advancement and the welfare of the mm -hmm. individual as well as the society. So that is what we expect. Uh, that is going to be the output or what we expect from the school. Now, you know that knowledge, attitudes, uh, attitudes, uh, skills. So that should be cultured uh, through the school system that's uh, the basic things but the society or what the parents or what anybody uh, can expect uh, from a school uh, setup or uh, system <clears throat> and also it should be uh, the welfare advancement and the welfare of the individual and as well as the society no, so both the individual and the society should get uh, something that is expected in an optimistic manner right uh, from the curriculum uh, development system so so once so the curriculum planners will have to decide on the content of the curriculum very thoughtfully yeah, that is you know that uh, and also should be drawn up in an efficient and effective manner using appropriate techniques and following sort of organization patterns right okay we are going to see uh, <coughs> sorry uh, the organization pattern of the curriculum and the strengths and the weakness of the curriculum, model curriculum, uh, Tyler's model, and uh, then Wheeler's model, Tava's uh, model, and the next thing. So you see that the existence of a well formulated curriculum is beneficial to both teachers and pupils. Formulated curriculum clearly indicates the subject matter that should be taught at each educational level and year. 
as well as the activities, methods, and the learning experiences to portray to that subject that we know that, that those things are the basic things. It is in a well formulated curriculum that one notices the existence of a functional and logical relationship between each section and aspect of it, as well as its useful. Yeah, there should be a relationship between the logical uh, background or the logical platform and as well as the functional. Logical in the sense, it's going to be a theoretical one or the conceptual one. And the functional, because both should go hand in hand. No, Otherwise, if you have something uh, theoretically, you have uh, uh, set up a curriculum, but functionally, it's not that much worth or it's uh, it does not fit to the school system or that, you know, uh, that there is a gap between the cultural or the traditional uh, practices and the curriculum that you have developed. So there is no, <coughs> not going to get a rapport with the functional and the logical relationship. So you should have a curriculum should have a functional and a logical relationship that uh, between each section and aspect of it as well as its usefulness. Eh? So that is very important. So since the section of the various components, sections and subject matter that be uh, should be essentially included in the curriculum, their proper organization and presentation is a complex and a difficult task. So that we know that we have already seen what is a curriculum, the organization and the setup. So the basic uh, setup points or the elements what we have already seen is talked. So it is a difficult task. It needs guidance. So principles of curricular development are essential and in important because they guide curricular formulation. These principles can be said to help in simplifying the complexity and difficulty found in curriculum formulation. Thus, it has to be admitted that these principles are an essential requirement for curriculum. So this paragraph says that you should have a guide. You should have a framework, right? In order to plan a curriculum. If you are going to develop a curriculum, if you are a curriculum developer, so you can develop, but you should have the proper framework there. So the basic things that you should know, uh, the contents of the curriculum, but we have already seen those things mm -hmm. and how the relationship between this uh, logical and the practical or the functional relationship that uh, go together. So those things are the things to be considered when you plan a curriculum. There is a set of principles which curriculum plan, uh, planners adopt in the organization of curricula here. Mm -hmm. Here, an attempt has been made to draw your attention to some such principles, right? Uh, there is a uh, scholar Sita Ramo in 1989. Uh, probably he should be from India because I have no, I have not heard about a scholar uh, Sita Ramo in Sri Lanka so far in, in the field of this curriculum of education. Probably he should be from India. So as points out four principles that are important in planning and drawing up a curriculum. Okay. So they are preparing the curriculum in conformity with the educational objectives, right? Yeah, that you should have the curriculum with the objectives of that education uh, in the country, in a country, in a different country. Mostly each and every country has um, their uh, objectives uh, in the education planning system, right? Almost basically the same, but uh, the difference a uh, little bit uh, from country to country. So the next one, paying attention to the pupil, pupil's needs, uh, interests, and uh, capabilities. So that is another one, right? Mm -hmm. So you should have, uh, you should pay, when you prepare that, you should uh, prepare a curriculum. Uh, Sita Ram has uh, addressed uh, the educational objective should be taken into consideration. Then attention to the pupil's needs, interests, and capabilities. Then paying attention to the needs of the community. Then inquiring into the utility of the curriculum. So these things have we have already learned in another way. Right? You know that once if you can recall your memories, what we were talking in the last uh, couple of classes, these are the things again and again. They are repeatedly uh, coming in uh, some different forms, but basically they are the same. So in the book titled Curriculum and Evaluation, published by the National Council for Education and Resource Training in India. Yeah. It has been pointed out that the following principles are important for curriculum organization. So, the principle of uh, variety, principle of needs, principle of relevance, 
principle of readiness, principle of flexibility. So in those, those are the things they are important for curriculum organization. Once you prepare and set up a curriculum, I should uh, these uh, things you should go through these things in order to get some idea or get to make your curriculum uh, make it better, right? So a brief inquiry. So we are going to see all these topics, all these uh, six topics, uh, and what they contain. Normally, uh, going by going through the title itself, we will be able to understand what they say. So the principles of utility, right? You will see that. Okay. So a uh, man is constantly in contact with uh, his uh, nature natural, physical, and social environment and developing new knowledge, attitudes, and skills. Let me know that. So, to extend that knowledge, attitudes, and skills, he acquires skills he acquires are useful to him as well as to the society. They are considered meaningful. So, utility, that what that means, it should be utilized. So, what you have, you know, if you, in case, you have say that you have developed a curriculum or there is a curriculum given to you that it should have that uh, should be able to uh, go uh, along with the knowledge, attitudes, the skills that is ever changing, you know, that due to the economical or the territorial or some other uh, social background. So they are considered meaningful. If what is in uh, attempted to impart through a curriculum results in knowledge, attitudes, and skills beneficial to the individual as well as to the society. Then curriculum is considered as a meaningful one. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. If the curriculum, is, you will understand no, simply that in case. Uh, if the curriculum is meaningful, it can be said to contain the principle of utility. Hence, in a curriculum that is drawn up for a particular period or a year, it is expected that the knowledge imparted to the individual and in amount which he can be absorbed by him and that should be provided. So this is the thing. That it should be a practicable, something that you can uh, practice in a human's life or in a society. So that should be the principle of utility. Knowledge, attitudes, and skills uh, so imparted should be beneficial to the individual and as well as the society. And we have already seen this one also. A curriculum should contain experiences, activities, and subject matter that would help in imparting the knowledge, skills, and attitudes, which are beneficial and useful to the individual and society at large. A curriculum drawn up taking all those matters into consideration can be deemed a curriculum formulated according to the principle of Utility, that is, you know, simply, basically, if you say that in a sentence, that a curriculum should be practicable, right? Should uh, the, what do you call, the complete or should meet the aspire. So what the people expect or the society expect from it. So what are the changes that can be brought through a curriculum in a student? His skills, his knowledge, his attitudes. So those things, that is called the utility principle, right? So the curriculum of utility principle, okay? So that is uh, simply understood, I think. Next, principle of variety. Knowledge takes different forms. It can be gained through different means, variety, what do you call it? Many wish to acquire different types of knowledge in different ways. Let me know that. It can be seen that man has a natural tendency to acquire different types of knowledge in a variety of ways. No one likes to confine himself to a single type of knowledge or nor to limit his knowledge to only one source. That is, you know, that it's obvious that because we don't want to get knowledge. Normally, we don't get knowledge uh, uh, through only a single channel, right? Even knowing and unknowing, you get so many ways of uh, developing your knowledges and experiences. So that is a variety is there. So different types, different forms. The same characteristics are found among school children too. They prefer to gain knowledge of different spheres according to their level of maturity and the environment 
in which they live. They anticipate guidance. Therefore, in a curriculum that is drawn up for school children, it is necessary to indicate the various aspects of knowledge suitable for them as well as the various sources through which this can be acquired. On account of individual differences among pupils in a classroom or due to the difference in the level of each pupil's knowledge too, it becomes necessary to present the different spheres of knowledge and the various ways of acquiring this through the curriculum. So that is the varieties through uh, different forms or through uh, different types of uh, knowledge acquiring systems. A student can meet, a student should be provided, should we should as a teacher or as as the society of student to get his knowledge, to get his skills, to get his experiences uh, through different uh, platforms or channels. Okay, so that is the one, the varieties. So very often the school curricula show signs of being dull and boring for pupils due to the disregard for the principle of variety owing to the formation of curriculum which purport to impart the same level of knowledge, experience, activities to all the students in the class. There are frequent instant instances of undesirable developments in schools such as failure, dropping out and repetition. Hence, when a curriculum is organized, it is appropriate to do so. Taking into consideration the principle of variety, you know, because this is seen uh, mostly even in Sri Lanka also, we see this, you know, Normally in Sri Lanka, we depend on almost, we depend on the textbooks, right? So that are uniform in even in Colombo or in a remote area or elsewhere, right? The same thing. So the same subject matter, <laughs> same type of knowledge, right? So even if you take a class, saying that there are 30 students in a class, so five to ten students may be in the gifted form, and another five to ten students will be in a slow learners form. So once uh, a teacher tries to impart the knowledge or the experience uniformly to the gifted one and the slow learners, it is not acceptable. It cannot be a successful classroom management. Right. So, but uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have such facilities. I think in uh, in uh, elsewhere in the countries in developed countries or in some other countries where we have uh, some sort of uh, sophisticated uh, modern learning teaching techniques. Uh, those things can be adapted. But in Sri Lanka, we have almost we are depending on the textbooks in order to cover up the syllabus. Right. Even the language also, even the language is also tested. Only in the written form. Say that the English language is tested only in the written form. For this, the ordinary language. Right? Even the mother tongue is tested only in the written form. But there are basically four forms. You know that. Reading, writing, listening and speaking. So they are the system or the resources availability of our curriculum mm -hmm. system. So uh, that cannot be helped. You know. Only some other latest ICT and uh, some other subjects in, um, in the private university system or, or in the even in the university system that can be tested uh, with the practicals and everything. But basically in GC O level, we don't have that. Okay. So uh, that is a setback in the system of the curriculum in Sri Lanka, in our country. Right? Next. Principle of needs. There are two types of needs which everybody expects to fulfill, namely biological needs and psychological needs. Right? You know that. So that is uh, the principal needs of a person. Air, water, warmth, food, leisure, exercise, and disposal of waste matter come under the biological needs. While security, affection, recognition, freedom, Responsibility and dignity are regarded as psychological needs because a human being, a man, needs both. People strive to fulfill these needs. Apart from these needs, we find in every society and social needs that are essential for its peaceful and smooth functioning. 
So by social needs, we mean development, culture, evaluation, <clears throat> various uh, values, viewpoints, and organizations. So these things, what we call the social needs. We have. So individual and social needs are manually related and operated. Hence, every society is seen attempting to fulfill its biological, psychological, and social needs. Right? So that is the, you know, uh, each and every society or each and every single individual in a society definitely strives to uh, reach these things or attain these things. Right. In curriculum formulations, to there is a concern for needs and it is deemed important. The curriculum is organized. So it's congenial to those who follow it and can be implemented successfully. <clears throat> Only if it suits to their needs and if it helps them to fulfill their needs. Hence, it is appropriate that a curriculum is formulated by taking into consideration the needs of the target population as well as those of the society where it is implemented. The, the same thing, I think, if you go through these things, uh, I think the same thing is being repeated here by various scholars and the writer of this the same textbook, right? Because the target population, the society, right? A curriculum should satisfy the society, the target population who the students. And the society means the parents and the other people who live around them. So that is the society. So uh, it should fulfill the requirements of the society. It should fulfill the requirements of the target population because they are the students. So that is the same thing we have been talking repeatedly. Next, principle of relevance because it should suit when you design. That's what, again, when we design or implement a curriculum, it should match the requirements. It should, uh, uh, one should feel that, uh, yes, this is acceptable. This is relevant to the society. This is uh, the same. This curriculum is relevant to the the time. Now, it's relevant to the country's uh, economical uh, situation or something like that. A curriculum should be relevant to the needs, problems and issues of the people who study it. Needs and problems change from place to place according to the nature of pupils. That we know that. Needs and uh, problems may change not exclusively according to the growth and maturity of peoples, but also according to the socio-economic issues that affect them. Because you know that socio-economical issues, they play a vital role in developing, implementing, and in harvesting a curriculum in a society. That is very important. Needs also change on account of differences such as high and low social classes, rural and urban background, you know that. <clears throat> because this uh, uh, high class or the upper class or the rural or the urban background, they have different tastes. They have different uh, requirements. So problems also change from place to place on account of differences found in schools, such as large and small and uh, as of a developed and undeveloped. Thus, the organization of the curriculum should be undertaken so as to suit relevant group and institution. So that is very important. Therefore, it is necessary to take the principle of relevance into consideration in organizing a curriculum. Hence, it can be said that due consideration should be given to the principle of relevance when developing curricula to suit the nature of the pupils, the regional and provincial uh, differences and the conditions of the schools. But do you think, right? Because even we can give you as a question also in Sri Lanka, Right? Do you think that these things are taken into consideration when developing a curriculum? So just justify your answers. Right? So you can uh, speak uh, for and against these things. You can speak in support of this or you can speak in against of these things. Right? Do the curriculum developers consider the nature of the pupils, the region and the provincial differences, even in Sri Lanka, within Sri Lanka? the conditions of the schools. I don't think so. So far in my experience. 
So in a developing country like Sri Lanka, these things cannot be done uh, 100% precisely. That's all we can say. So theoretically, you should understand that there are these things that should be considered when developing a curriculum. Right. Next, principle of readiness. <laughs> It is more effective to present to the pupils that is intended to be presented to them at a time the pupils are prepared to receive or acquire it. That is another one. Right? A teacher, even not only preparing a curriculum, even when implementing a curriculum also, uh, so that you are uh, teaching a lesson today, and it should, the teacher should be aware that the students are ready to accept the situation so this, uh, they accept the subject matter that you are going to teach today right so in some cases in the primary school system you know, sometimes when we start to teach maths in the morning itself the students they won't like to study maths sometimes so they like to do some activities they like to draw something uh, so if, or in another way that even in the afternoon sessions Right, even during the lunch session, so after lunch sessions, if you have the schools, so they don't want to study much at that time also. They like to do some exercise, they want to relax. So these things should be considered even while delivering a curriculum. So planning a curriculum and preparing a curriculum needs more focus. Okay. <clears throat> two factors affect readiness, namely the pupil and the environment. So these are the two factors that affect the readiness of the uh, principle of readiness from the side of the people his maturity right pre-knowledge abilities and potentialities values expectations and targets affect readiness while from the side of the environment readiness is affected by the physical conditions of the classroom school environment in the teaching process classroom and the school environment can be considered one uh, uh, matter or you can uh, have them uh, in two different things. So, but the teaching process is another different one. Therefore, the curriculum planners should be concerned about organizing the curriculum so as to be able to present what is called the appropriate type. But we know that. Next. <clears throat> It is appropriate for the curricula to be drawn up so as to enable the teacher to present the subjects and activities when the pupil possess the, uh, possesses the biological maturity, psychological readiness, the necessary pre-knowledge, attitude, skills, and abilities. <coughs> right, next, um, principle of flexibility. It appears <laughs> that the rapid growth of knowledge, population and social expectations have greatly affected the rapid changes in the world. The above changes have influenced the various aspects of human life. They influence people's learning too. <clears throat> in a changing world, it is difficult to implement the rigid curriculum successfully. That You know that. Therefore, curriculum farmers, uh, sorry, framers have been concerned about organizing the curriculum with a certain amount of flexibility. Yeah. <clears throat> Nowadays, you know, you should have flexibility. So when you impart uh, knowledge, skills, and attitude, because the different factors affect a human being, affect uh, uh, a student. So you can't have, uh, like in the older days, in the, uh, in the early years, uh, uh, time just about say that 40 50 years back, you can have a complete and strong uh, system of uh, implementing, preparing, and learning or monitoring the system. But nowadays, <coughs> it's impossible, you know. That so, in a curriculum, it is appropriate to have compulsory and optional subjects as well as academic and practical subjects. What we have here in Sri Lanka, that is so we have some compulsory subjects and some optional, subject, op optional subjects. Uh, right? Okay, there. Yeah. So, when presenting the curriculum to be adapted according to the facilities available in a school and also according to the pupils' interest, it is necessary for the teachers to have the opportunity 
to follow various methods and a sequence that suit the people's needs. These features reflect the flexibility of the curriculum. So when the curriculum does not contain these characteristics, it will be reduced to the status of a mechanical curriculum. Yeah, that's it. Right? If you don't have this flexibility, then readiness, that what we have been seeing, the varieties, the relevance, right? the needs, the needs of the students are considered. If you don't, if your curriculum doesn't have these contents, then it is going to be a mechanical curriculum. Right? It's not going to be uh, 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 what do you call this? There is no <clears throat> I don't know how can I say that there is no life in that curriculum. It cannot be practiced. Right? It's just you uh, implement a mechanical curriculum. Even the students, uh, they like it or not, you are going to carry out. So what happens then is that the implementation of the curriculum will be confined to the recommended books, subject method and methods. Yeah. This monotonous nature of the curriculum will make it boring for both teachers and pupils. Sometimes we have that here. Hence, it is necessary to be concerned with the principle of flexibility in the formulation and organization of the curriculum, right? That you know that you can do it even if uh, if our curriculum, even if it is given in a uh, clear and uh, sometimes a mechanical system, even the teachers can make it practicable with their flexible uh, approach towards the students, right? You can just give them a relief, right? They, you can just make them uh, their willingness to learn by giving this flexibility and uh, everything. So that uh, depends on the teacher who adapts and who applies this curriculum system towards the student, right? Then, so what are the curriculum development models? So we are going to see uh, some curriculum development models here. So those are the uh, things that we were talking about uh, in the Indian book of curriculum and evaluation, right? Uh, that was published in, the, in an India publication. So that we went through that. Now we will see what are the curriculum development models. Okay. <clears throat> From about four decades ago, a number of changes have occurred in the field of curriculum. The world over. These changes brought about progress in curriculum development and corresponding to this. The word model in English means uh, it's a diagram, a prepared figure or a profile, an elementary pattern or plan. But you know what is a, a model? The simple meaning of the word model is something prepared according to some form. It is a model for emulation or an exemplary work. Right? Emulating means it is just imitating something, doing uh, like something. It is an imitating. So accordingly, a curriculum model can be described as a framework or a plan that can be taken as an example for drawing up a curriculum. So curriculum models are used to identify the influence of the stages included in the curriculum development process. And to illustrate these stages and their interrelationships in an attempt to represent that process in a simple manner. So, because we have, uh, we'll go uh, go through some uh, curriculum models, and you can just uh, apply even if you have uh, some ideas of developing a curriculum, or even we can apply our school system, our subject. Uh, we can take any subject. You can just apply it to these models and see uh, the successfulness of this. Even uh, are they uh, successfully? Um, can be carried out or have some other problems or something like that. We'll see that at uh, what stages we have uh, uh, faced in, in the past, in our experience, we have faced, uh, we have some problems while uh, applying these things, our, our system or our curriculum to these models. And we'll see them. <clears throat> so in this exercise, uh, it was not sufficient to represent the curriculum development process with only one model. Kelly 1978 has expressed as uh, 
It is in the following manner. The universe is open to various interpretations. Yeah, I didn't know that. Different persons understand it in different ways. It is open to the creativity of an individual. Right? If you have creativity, so if you have the creativity, you can deliver it successfully. If you have the creativity, you can understand it successfully. So both the teacher and the student or the curriculum developers and the teachers should have this, uh, what do you call this um, system, right? That uh, That is developed within the, the creativity of learning something, right? You should have it. <clears throat> That's taking advantage of the opportunities available for the reconstruction of the world. There emerged a number of different models for curriculum too. Right? Because uh, different scholars, as said by Kelly now, the world is open to various interpretations. So different scholars uh, put forward their interpretations according to the <coughs> data or the information they received uh, that depend on the uh, era they lived uh, on the territorial, uh, what do you call this, um, the area, right? In the territory or the region or the country they live, uh, that differs. But unfortunately, uh, we are copying the uh, European model or some other Western model, right? I have not, no, here, uh, we have not seen anything uh, from Sri Lanka or the Oriental uh, people. Right, okay. So, <clears throat> Most uh, prominent among the presenters of these models are Ralph Tyler, D.K. Wheeler, Dennis Lawton, John F. Kerr, and Malcolm Skillback. So these are the uh, most prominent uh, scholars who have uh, talked on uh, curriculum. By following the balance of these uh, plans, it is possible to develop a scientific curriculum. That is important here to examine in order some of the models of eminent curriculum developers. Right? We'll see those. <clears throat> right? So we'll see this. Uh, Tyler's model. Yeah. The basis of uh, Tyler's model. The model developed uh, by R. W. Tyler, United States in America in 1949. See how old is it now? It is almost uh, 49, 51, and 23, 74, 74 years, 75 years old. Still we are talking about it. Right? How fortunate we are, I don't know. Right? It's regarded as the first model of curriculum development. Taylor's model is referred to as an objectives model based on objectives that we have already seen this one. For the selection of aims and objectives of a curriculum, Taylor considered five sources. These sources are shown in figure one. So Taylor considered five sources. Right? The first one, the learner. Right? So this is the most important person, the learner, right? If you prepare a curriculum using the world's most prominent expert in preparing a curriculum, could be uh, somewhere from any country, but say that we have the best curriculum, but if you are a learner, if your students are not ready to take it up, then that curriculum system is totally at a failure. So the students who learn that they should be able to receive it. They should be able to adapt that system of uh, curriculum development and implementation. Right? Because, but they don't purposely reject it, but the socio-economical and the cultural uh, uh, factors that they live in will automatically put them to accept or to reject that curriculum. So that is very important. The learner is very important. Then the contemporary life that is connected to the learner, you know that the contemporary life should be uh, taken into consideration, right? We can't, but actually, even we are in the, we are going back to the uh, 50, 40 years ago, but the contemporary life uh, should be taken into consideration. 
then the subject uh, specialists, right? Then philosophy and psychology. Those are the needs, very important ones. Then from these things, the selection of aims and the objectives will be selected from these things, right? <clears throat> so what we call, so before selecting the uh, aims or the objectives in order to set up a curricula, you should consider the five things, the learner, contemporary life, subject specialist, philosophy and psychology, right? That is very important. <clears throat> then, according to Tyler, the objectives of the curricula are selected on the basis of these five sources, right? So you have to consider these five sources, the learner, the contemporary life, the subject specialists, the philosophy behind that, and the psychology. So psychology deals with the mind of the students, the teachers, and the society. You should consider all, not only the students, but the teachers and the society. So, so you have to consider all these things and then to set up the aims or the objectives of that curriculum. Right? <clears throat> these five. It is very important to select the aims of a curriculum at the outset itself. If the objectives are not clear, then the other tasks pertain to the curriculum development become ineffective. Yeah, that is very important. The basic, the first step is to create your objectives. So in case if the objectives are not clear, if you are unable to um, uh, put forward your objectives clearly, then this is the initial step. And if the foundation is not laid properly, you can't build the building uh you can't expect the building to be strong enough okay so that is the one so in order to get your objectives you have to consider the learner the contemporary life subject specialist philosophy psychology this one the Taylor says <clears throat> until the introduction of Taylor's curriculum model what was more important in the teaching process was the subject matter selected by the teacher in whatever manner the model of curriculum development presented by Ralph Taylor in 1949 is illustrated in figure 2. I will see that. So, before, until that the model was introduced, the curriculum development was solely based on the interest, the likes and the dislikes of the teacher, in whatever the manner that means. So, that was organized properly in 1949, right? In 1949, actually, it was organized properly, right? Otherwise, the teacher thinks the same subject is taught by different teachers by different ways, right? In earlier days, right? Say that if a politics is taught by in those days, the politics or some other things or the anything, any language or anything uh, taught by the teachers, right? They didn't have the proper way of developing the curriculum. But there was a curriculum, but that was developed by the uh, by the teacher or the group of teachers or something that without these basic foundations that were uh, uh, were not considered. So Taylor's model <coughs> in 1949 series again contemporary life, philosophy, psychology, selection of objectives. From that, you go to the content of the curriculum. Then from that, you organize the curriculum and then you evaluate the curriculum. How far, how success you have uh, done the work. So this is basically, you know that we that already seen this one also. Again, the basic principles, right? So in order to get these objectives, uh, selecting uh, the learning, organizing the learning and the uh, content, organizing the learning and the evaluation, you should take into consideration of four questions. The first one, so what are the educational aims to be attained through the school? So this is a question that is expected to have uh, to set up your objectives. So what are the educational aims to be attained through the schools? 
right? So, because you school, you see that normally um, in order to develop the curriculum, uh, you know, in Sri Lanka or elsewhere, normally um, uh, each uh, and every school, uh, they don't have their own curriculum because uh, uh, uniform curriculum is set up and a uniform curriculum is uh, distributed among the schools in a country like that. So, uh, through the school or uh, schools, right? Through schools in the country or in, elsewhere. We can say that. So, objectives. So, what are the educational aims to be attained through the school? Right? That is another question. Then, question number two. How can learning experiences which may be useful experiences in attaining these objectives be selected? Because... <clears throat> You have now selected the objectives. So what are the learning experiences that can be given successfully to the student in order to get these um, objectives uh, reached clearly? Okay. So because there can be different platforms, there can be different ways of uh, delivering your curriculum, delivering your teaching, something like that. So you have to select the best that suits the students the regional uh, or the cultural or the uh, what is expected from the society, from the students, right? Okay. So maybe useful experience in attaining these uh, objectives be selected. So because I'm just elaborating the questions. Then the organizing learning, another question. How can these learning experiences be organized for experience uh, effective instruction? <laughs> So how can this learning experience be organized? So you have to organize your uh, system of presentation, right? You know, I have, we have already talked, uh, spoken about this one because normally a lesson is built up or a curriculum is built up from the known to the unknown and not from the unknown to the known. In the last class we spoke about it, right? From the known matter to the unknown matter. So once the lesson is over, or once the topic is over, or once the competency is over, the uncom the non meta to the proximal place to a student. So the student will begin from the non meta from his proximal place or from his proximal point. But the distal point there will be an unknown meta. Once the class is over, or once the uh, competency is uh, done or reached, or once the unit is over. Then that uh, distal uh, point where the unknown matter will become the proximal point with a known matter, right? So this is a chain of reaction that goes in the learning system. So these, so how can you experience, uh, organize the experiences to give a best, to the best out of your contents? Right? That is another one. The fourth question is the evaluation. So how can the difference, effectiveness of learning experience be evaluated? So you have done everything now. So as a teacher or as a school or as a regional or zonal or as a country itself, you have given up everything. All the stuff is given to the students. They have learned something. You have facilitated the students to learn everything. So now you want to see how fruitful or how effectiveness uh, that is seen uh, <clears throat> in your uh, learning te uh, teaching phenomena. So that is, you are going to evaluate it. So in Sri Lanka, we have so many systems, the new national evaluating system is there. That is the examination department. So uh, below that you have the provincial exams, zonal level, schools level, and even in the classroom level. So we have that. So how can the effectiveness of the learning experience be evaluated? So how are you going to evaluate these things? That's why again I'm coming to the point that in Sri Lanka, in the general examinations, we have only one source of evaluating. What is that? Tell me now. I've been speaking so far. Tell me. What is that source? Or oh, what is that point of evaluating? You are talking about now. Savindi, can you tell me? No answer. 
What's that? Sir, only variable exam. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that is only one source of evaluating is there. What is that source? We were talking. Taranga, please. Can you tell me? Memory, sir. No, no, no. That is memorizing. Okay, okay. Memorizing something. But the output, the basic factor, the basic skill, what is that uh, tested there? Taranga, miss. Are you there? Through the exam, the book. Yeah, that is only the written form of the subject. And even if there is a practical test, but they don't give that much um, weight to that. 90% of that uh, is given uh, to the written form. Even you know that in the schools, they do some projects for A-level students. Even for each and every, the projects. Actually, they are, not, they are also not carried out properly. They just ask the student to do something they just uh, without any uh, proper system of uh, uh, of uh, doing a project, any objectives, any proposals without a complete or perfect proposal or output or they just do it. They give the marks. They attach it to the exam developer uh, department. Then the marks uh, along with their results, you get some other uh, marks or grading or something like that. Right. So uh, that is one uh, sad thing in uh, when we talk about Sri Lanka. But in other developed countries and European countries, they have some sort of different things. You know, the test them. You know that in IELTS and everything, you have so many, all these things, reading, writing, this thing, everything is there. So a, a paper or an exam evaluation should be like that. So the question for how can the effectiveness of learning experiences be evaluated? So how are you going to evaluate the effectiveness of this? So that is another question. So by answering these four questions, you can form these objectives, uh, selecting learning, organizing learning, and evaluation. So now we'll see the uh, special features of Tyler's model. According to Tyler's model, prior to developing a curriculum answers are sought to four crucial questions that we have already seen. This is clear from figure three, you know that. Uh, so the Tyler's model is developed according to these four questions. To begin with, Tyler determines the objectives of a curriculum using the sources and then proceeds to select the subject matter that suits the objectives thus determined. The next step is organizing the selected subject matter for the learning process. And in the final stage, the success of the process is evaluated. As it is clear that the four stages, namely determination of the objectives, selecting subject matter, organizing learning experiences, and evaluation are sequentially related to each other. Thus, this indicates four important stages in the curriculum development model. Moreover, Taylor's is a linear process beginning with sources and ending with evaluation. This is called a linear model of curriculum development, right? You should keep in mind. If you are asked to write something about, write an example of a linear model of curriculum development. So that means you should understand that they are asking the question uh, about Taylor's model, right? But we'll see in the other, uh, the next model, we'll see that wheelers model, it's a um, cyclical model, right? Taylor's model is a linear model, and that is a cycle. Cyclical model is Wheeler's model. So because um, there are some shortcomings, so there are some, uh, what do you call this, uh, uh, minuses in the Taylor's model, uh, because um, it's, uh, the evaluation ends with that, and we see that, and there is nothing after that. It should not be so. Okay. So the weakness in Tyler's model. So you know that the Tyler's model is a linear model, right? These are the determination objectives, selecting subject matter, organizing learning experiences and evaluation sequentially, sequentially related to each other. You know that. So weakness uh, Tyler's model is the curriculum is a complete and continuous process. 
and there should be a mutual relationship with, uh, among its station, uh, stages. However, Taylor's model begins with objectives and ends with evaluation. Here, while only the first stage relates to the second, there's no mutual relationship among the four stages. Even though they are sequentially related to each other, there is no mutual relationship among the four stages. You know, the, the last stage evaluation, it ends with that. So it is blindfolded there. So after evaluation, what to do? There is no connection again with the objectives. There is no connection again with the subject content. There is no connection again with the organization of the learning experiences because okay so this is one thing that uh it is a minus a setback in the Taylor's model the final next one we'll see that the final stage of his curriculum model was evaluation that we were talking about. apart from this the model does not indicate an evaluation of revision of different stages. The main weakness in Taylor's model is that its process does not provide for the evaluation or revision of the objectives and subject matter once selected. J.S. Bruna has described the act of doing evaluation only at the end of the curricular process as as espionage espionage after the war. Espionage means once the after the war. That means uh, Bruno says that it is uh, something like uh, once the war is over, whether you lost or you won, after that you send you a spy to study the situation. It's like that, right? So it is not so, right? Before the war, you have to send you a spy and know the ground situation whether it's favor or in favor or not favor of you. So likewise, the Bruno has described that uh, it is uh, evaluation only at the end of the curriculum. Right? So after completing everything, you go for the evaluation, go towards the evaluation. So he says that because he points out that in each and in another way, you, have to, you can consider that in each and every part of the curriculum development, there should be evaluation. See, when determining of objectives, you should have an evaluation. Then selecting the subject matter is also so. Organizing learning experiences also so. So once the evaluation is done, it should have a connection with the objectives. Then it should go back towards the selecting subject matter. Then only you can analyze what you have evaluated. So that is the main uh, setback in his uh, now, the next one is the Wheeler's model. So, before going on to the Wheeler's model, now can you just talk something? Can you just prepare or get an idea of this Taylor's model uh, of his uh, determination of objectives, selecting subject matter, <clears throat> organizing learning experience and evaluation. So, how can these uh, all four matters be connected to each other? Right? Say that the it is a linear model. You know that. But you have to make it, if you can, you have to make it, it's a cyclical model. Because it should have a cross connection with each and every content of that. Okay? Uh, so how can you do that? How Just you have to speak about uh, considering this uh, for, I'll just give you a five minutes time. Okay? And uh, Tarangamis and Samindi, can you uh, just uh, speak something about the objectives, select the subject, meta organize learning experience, evaluate. But how can these matters be connected, uh, interlinked, or cross connected with each other in, in a bilateral way? Right? Though it is a linear model, that we have to reorganize it using a bilateral way, using your own experience uh, when you write an objective in a lesson. When you select the subject matter, when you organize your learning, when you uh, that means organizing learning experiences means just how you deliver the lesson. That is in other word, it says that how the steps, the steps of delivering the lesson. That means from the basic 
to the complex, right? Simple to hard from the known to the unknown. It is like that. How you can then finally evaluate. So how can these all four things be connected together? Oh, five minutes time. Let's prepare. Just speak it out for one or two minutes. Okay. After that, we'll go to the Wheeler's model. Okay.
Okay. We'll start now. Can you speak something? Tarangamis, uh, uh, can you tell something about the the objective, selecting subject matter, organizing, learning, evaluation uh, for a lesson? How you will do it? Just simply, just briefly outline. Please. Uh, so I thought like how we we are going to explain how we are going to interconnect it. Is that yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Okay, anything. That's so right. the uh, determination of objectives. That's what we object to be to be achieved yeah. during the uh, end of the lesson. So mm. next, uh, the next one is uh, selecting subject matter, which is like select the co course content and uh, learning experience. So in mm. that's both of them comes under like planning, but in the next step, at the next step, organizing learning experience that we organize the course continent we, uh, that learning experience. So there that, we can uh, use how, our reflection. Yeah, how you deliver the lesson. Yes. So, first, so after that, then we will. We uh, yeah. The yeah. How uh, like how do we how we are going to do the lesson? Uh -huh. How we are going to complete the task? So okay. there we get our reflection, which is connect again, yeah, like which is connected to uh, fine with the we have achieved our objective or not, and changes to be done do do in the learning experience. Yeah, yeah, there you yeah. get your reflection. There is also, yes. and at the end of the evaluation, also you will get your reflection. Yes, like and we can identify the students' needs and level of understanding through the evaluation mm -hmm. as well. Again, we can yeah. go back to the uh, objective or the. A subject content where any yeah, changes that to is, be made. That, uh, yeah, that we call is the feedback after the evaluation, right? That is yes, called sir. the feedback. Feedback because you find the uh, strengths and weaknesses of the students. Once you give those weaknesses, then you have to go back again. Uh, delivering method, and you feel you'll find where you'll bring him up. So that is called the feedback. Okay. Okay, that's done. Next. Uh, Savindi, can you tell me? Yes, sir. Phil. First, we have to select objectives uh, because the end of the lesson, a student will be able to do that and understand well. Uh, second, we have to select the subject area uh, for relevant to relevant to the given time period then as well as uh, fulfill the objectives and how to do that. Uh, then we should make activities to give experience for the students from the objectives. Then finally, we should evaluate the students to know uh, actually they got the point or not and also our lesson is okay or not. Yeah, evaluation is done. Uh, so one thing now, now either you Tarangamis or uh, Samindi, you can answer. Uh, see that uh, will you take? Uh, will you consider the whole uh, the matter, subject matter, and uh, the whole uh, objectives uh, for a session, or in a session, or for a period? No, sir. No, sir. No, you should not do. Yeah, no, because that depends on the level of your students' uh, knowledge, your students' experiences, your students, um, uh, what do you call this, uh, how they practice in the class. That depends on the teacher. Even you say that if you have four objectives in order to complete uh, uh, competency level, competency level is called the sub-competency, in other words. So if the students are ready to acquire all these four objectives in a session, you can give them using the uh, subject matter. Or if they are not ready, that you know that about well about your students. So you have to uh, uh, focus more on the slow learners, right? So if they are not ready to catch up all four objectives, you just present them with two objectives. You can take the next two, the next uh, lesson. So that depends that. Uh, is uh, that depends on the teacher that uh, discretion is uh, totally given to the teacher, right? Because uh, systematically we cannot uh, 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 a curriculum developer or even an observer 
even uh, say that your superior or a lecturer or an observer who observes your letter cannot define that, cannot make any decisions on that. That is uh, purely, solely based, solely given to the teacher. So teacher has the right to decide uh, upon uh, to take whether the whole objectives or one, two, or three, or anything like that. So that is very important, right? You should not because so you can't always stick to the teacher's guide, right? Teacher's guide is uh, is written common, right? But uh, that depends when uh, you see your uh, students; they are not capable enough to come up with all these four objectives. For an example, say what I was talking. So you can take one or two objectives like that, so, and also you can. Uh, simplify the learning experiences that you give the students. That that depends on the teacher. That uh, the right, the authorities uh, totally given to the teacher. No one can uh, force the teacher to do like this, or no one can question the teacher why you are doing like this. But you should have a proper answer. Then that is yours. Okay. So this is uh, what we were talking about Taylor's model. Now now we'll come to the Wheeler's model. This is a cyclical nature of Wheeler's model. Okay. So what we call the cyclical nature. Another model reflecting the stages of curricular development, uh, development was presented by Dicke Wheeler 1967. Wheeler put forward his curriculum development model by effecting several changes to the curriculum model drawn up by Tyler. So he made some changes. Basically, he took something from Tyler and made some changes. This model known as Wheeler's model is not linear as Taylor's. It is a cyclical model. We know that. Wheeler's model appears to have contributed a great deal towards the organization. So Wheeler's model is far better uh, than Taylor's model when considered because he had made some changes. So again, we see that the aims, goals, and objectives, selection of learning, selection of subject content, organizing and integrating, uh, inter uh, integrating um, learning experiences and subject content, then evaluation. Number five is evaluation. Then again, it goes to the aims and uh, aims, goals and objectives. So it is a cyclical model. So the evaluation again get connected to the aims. So evalu the evaluation focuses whether the aims and goals or, uh, or the objectives have uh, been reached uh, uh, by the students so i mean they have gone towards the student to the students so the value that we check it you what uh, as um, taranga is told it's a reflection it's a sort of a reflection it's like okay so this is the wheeler cyclical model <clears throat> similar to tyler's model uh, Wheeler's model two begins with aims and objectives it is like that it indicates five stages such as each uh, stage affects the next, right? It has a connection with the uh, next, each and every uh, stage uh, as a connection with the next stage. This model shows the selection of learning experiences according to the aims, goals, and objectives determine all the outset and the selection of subject content accordingly. This is followed by organizing and integrating the program for imparting learning experiences through the selected subject matter. Then for the a realization of the anticipated objectives and finally the process of evaluation. The five stages are shown cyclically using arrows to indicate their influence on each other. Mm -hmm. Right? It has, you know, that if a part of the if a part of uh, the cycle is removed or broken, so the cycle is incomplete. It won't work like that. So the use of arrows reflect the continuous and dynamic nature of the curriculum. So that's it. The selection process of learning experiences in the curriculum indicated in this model. The step forward from Taylor's model. This is so because Wheeler has shown the two aspects, learning experiences and subject matter separately in this model. So we'll see the special features in Wheeler's model. In this model, learning experience and subject content are indicated separately and learning experience have been given priority. Learning experience are not limited only to subject matter related to the standard school subjects found in the textbook. Everything necessary to realize the broad objectives expected from education. All experiences we can gain from books as well as from outside resources. Sources are known as the learning experience. Right. Wheeler, this is one important thing that that's what I was talking in another way. 
that you should plan your lesson according to the requirement or according to the need or according to the level of your student right there will be something in the uh, uh, in the textbook but based on that you cannot go deviate from the textbook because then you will end up with some other place but having the basic um, uh, idea found in the textbook you can construct the class you can develop the class according to your wish as you wish because you know the level you know the desire you know the uh, need of the student there right so that is very important so Vila has given a special uh, what do you call point he has given specially uh, something that is known as a learning experience the teacher can develop uh, from the textbook or text materials knowledge gathered from various subjects and books help to enrich these experiences therefore the model shows the manner in which the learning experiences are selected and they are up how the subject matter which can be used to enrich these experiences should be selected so that is one point so because in a simply if you say that the teacher villa has given the priority so the authority to the teacher in order to select the best thing the best uh, content or the best uh, delivering system that suits his or her students so to get that he should uh, go to the uh, just beyond the textbook because he has to see the students uh, knowledge experiences gained and as well as the teachers experiences and knowledge another special feature of this model is the representation of the curricular development process and cyclic process accordingly the curriculum development process is not static. You know that. It is not static. It is a dynamic and a continuous process because it is moving. It is moving towards. So you add something, right? With time passage, you add something, you remove something, right? You recondition the system. You add, you remove. You add, you remove. If you see that if something that you add is um, working well, so that is anticipated by the student then you keep on sticking to that if that is not uh, interested if that is not interested by the students then you remove that then you take the best thing and then you add it so it is like that so the villa has given the choice to the teacher in other words you can say that so that is the interpretation of these things so we'll see the weakness in Wheeler's model. So that is also given there because there is something as developed by human. So you'll see that. The weakness, even though this model contains more advanced features than Tyler's model, the fact that evaluation is not related to other stages in a weakness. It's a weakness, sorry. Here the evaluation is related only to aims and objectives, right? That's what I was talking always. There is no cross connection between the elements of the cyclical form. Do you understand? The evaluation is only related to the aims and objectives. It is not related, we'll see the cyclical model again. The evaluation is related only to the aims and goals and objectives. It is not related to the selection of learning. It is not related to the selection of subject content. It is coming from the organization. Then so there is no interconnected or cross relationship between the um, contents of this uh, VLS model. So that is one weakness. Okay. In another words, we say that. So everything uh, necessary to realize everything necessary uh, to realize the broad uh, sorry, we are here. So that is the weak. Here evaluation relate only to aims and objects. However, weaknesses or problems can arise at any stage of implementation of a curriculum. You know that. Problems can arise at any stage at the uh, implementation stage or the evaluation stage or even by, uh, when you decide the uh, aims and objective stage and any stage can be seen, uh, problems can arise. Sometimes the aims and objectives may be incorrect or there can be errors in the learning experience of the subject content or there can be weaknesses in the manner in which subjects have been organized. Similarly, the evaluation methods used may be faulty because since the evaluation doesn't have interconnections with this uh, learning methodology, with this 
uh, organizing the subject content, there can be some other problems formed. Therefore, it should be possible to evaluate curriculum projects at any stage of their implementation. However, both Taylor's and Wheeler's models lack this feature. Right? It is very clear. Right? Do you understand that the evaluation, the process, uh, Taylor's model is only connected, is only given at the last, at the last one. It doesn't have a connection with the first objectives and aims, but Wheeler's model is better than the Taylor's model because it has a connection with the uh, aims and objectives, but it doesn't have connections with the content and the delivering of the process organization system. So even though curricular development is shown as a single cyclic process, its stages are separate processes. At the time this model was introduced by Wheeler, Bloom's classification of educational objectives, Phoenix's ideas on subject content and a number of concepts related to the curriculum had been developed. But unfortunately, Wheeler does not seem to have taken those ideas and concepts into consideration in developing his curriculum development model. So this is very important. So by this time, uh, Wheeler was uh, uh, delivering his or uh, uh, bringing out or uh, disclosing out his uh, system of curriculum development. Bloom's classification of educational objectives. Phoenix's ideas on the subject and the content of uh, and a number of concepts and some other concepts related to the curriculum had been developed and uh, given to the world. But uh, Wheeler did not want to take consideration of these things. He just put forward his own ideas. But even it is uh, accepted. It was accepted uh, at a certain period in the time, in the past, and even now we are talking about it. So there is something that Rila also has made a prominent in uh, developing a curriculum uh, system. So with this, uh, we'll wind up today's lesson. So I'll send this one also uh, to this. Samindi, so, can you uh, adapt? Uh, I'll give my number to you. So just put me a message and then I can send this this classes and the last classes note, okay? You just okay. note down my WhatsApp number. Add me and just send me a message that you are. 075 77, write it down, uh, 075 77 That's my WhatsApp. I will just uh, drop a message, then I will send those notes. Okay. Thank you, sir. So we'll wind up with this, okay? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Oh, yeah, uh, good night. Okay, okay, see you then. Huh? Good night. Good night, sir. Okay.